Chapter clicked in to College Volleyball Weekly on Viral Volley Media. Now here's your host, Rob on Mike. All right, good day, everyone. Welcome to episode 208 of College Volleyball Weekly. It's a week seven or episode seven of the young, well, third of the way through the NCAA Men's Division One Two season. On screen are Theo Edwards of CSUN, Jay Hosick of George Mason, Brad Rostretter of UC San Diego, and Dan Friend will come in hot, as he always does, with that new logo for the Lewis Flyers. Instead of the <laughs> cute pilot guy, they've got a cool jet flying across the middle of their logo. So, uh, <laughs> gentlemen, good to see you again this week, and I hope, uh, well, uh-oh, Jay's, Jay's on minute. vacation, so he's in a good mood. <laughs> Two things. First of all, 208? Is that 208 of just men's college volleyball weekly, or is that 208 including the women's? That's including the women's. It's all okay. in the no, same platform. That's all another number. Now we're right <laughs> on the kill. Second of all, uh, I vote we we name Dan from now on Cool Pilot Guy. Cool Pilot. Because that is the best nickname I've ever heard from him. What's up, Cool, cool Pilot, Pilot Guy? guy. <laughs> or give him a call sign instead like slider <laughs> well with that we uh we uh we i like this segment it's called the elephant in the room it's the matches with the coaches involved on the screen <laughs> so <laughs> what am i doing here then <laughs> <laughs> because you're in a good mood jay and you're fresh off a of vacation and we like having your input when you're in a good mood too so <laughs> but we're going to start off with um we, we chat before going on Masters of the Matadors, Ma- Masters of the Universe, but Masters of the Matadors. Theo Edwards with a uh, 03 loss to the Masters University and neighbor right down the freeway. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. This was a this was an interesting week for us. I think, you know, you asked most of the coaches, you there's there are a handful of weeks where you deal with some injuries and you have some things that are going on in your program. And, um, early in the week, we lost one of our starting outside hitters, uh, Griffin Walters, who ended up entering back into the lineup the second match of the week, um, but had lost a little bit of his rhythm. Um, the Masters came in and, and played great. Uh, going into this week, they were the number one ranked NAIA team. Um, and, you know, I think one of the one of the cool conversations, is, you know, Brad obviously, you know, got his start at the NAIA. And, and created a, a fantastic program over at Vanguard. But uh, Jared is doing something really similar at Masters, and they have some really talented players. Um, Diego Perez is a guy who was at Pepperdine for many years and and is playing outside for them and really talented, great passer. Um, they've, they've got a lot of really good players, one of them, uh, one of them being Patrick Paragas, uh, setter from, from Santa Barbara back in the day. Um, he actually injured his ankle. Um, and didn't have an opportunity to play this week, but they're doing some really, really great things. They're very old. They've got a lot of seniors, a lot of grad students. Um, and what we were talking about before the camera started was they, you know, they have some advantages in terms of some eligibility stuff where potentially, and I talked a little bit with Jared about this, where guys that might not be NCAA division one eligible can bounce back to a school like NAIA and have a great opportunity to, til- to, to still compete and and to do it at a high level and uh anyways i thought they played really well we ended up hitting almost close to 400 and and uh i think we hit 360 they hit 360 it was actually some really good volleyball uh they definitely beat us at the service line our our serving just was not where it needed to be in order to win that match but i thought they played really well and uh apparently they shot their looks they went down to concordia and, and got beat by concordia the next day but uh Anyways, it was it was a tough match for us and a, and a tough week of some adversity and a long locker room meeting that followed. So, uh, <laughs> a lot of fun. Well, that's funny. Are you trying to throw one of your colleagues on the screen under the bus? Because that's a great <laughs> segue <laughs> into the next topic, which is the Screaming Eagles soar over the Tritons. Yeah, I was ready to just Brad talk Ross about Matadors and uh, and the Mustangs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, we had one match this week and, uh, went up to Concordia, uh, and, uh, they played really, really well. And even going into it, we knew it was going to be a little bit weird just because, you know, in the past two weeks, they had played central state and beat them pretty good and then played long beach and got beat pretty good. 
Um, so there wasn't a ton of information and data to go over uh, in terms of scouting and preparation. Uh, but yeah, we got up there and um, just we did not play well. You know, we hit negative on the match. Um, we served really poorly as well, um, which uh, I think everyone listening knows that's not a great combination uh, <laughs> to be successful. Uh, but I thought uh, Concordia did some things really well. They have two freshman pin hitters, one opposite, one outside hitter. Both of those guys stepped up and played well. Gage Doble, something we talked about a few times last week or last year, year on the podcast. Uh, he had a really good performance, uh, attacked well, passed well, um, and played really good. And um, they have a setter, uh, Yotam Brigger, uh, and he he played great. He was really good uh, running his offense, but even better defensively, he made a couple plays on defense that I think early on ended up frustrating us and, and giving us some problems. Uh, but yeah, they, they played great and um, we uh, did not respond uh, as we needed to. Well, one of the athletes you're referring to Christian Galapo, six kills, three digs, but it's defensively what he did uh, solo block and five block assists. So uh good night for Christian Galapo. I believe he is a foreigner as well. Freshman, yeah. um, so, but not, I thought it was Italian, but he's actually from another country. Like, uh, at, you know, just, I didn't expect that. I was going to look him up a little more, but uh, they do have a pretty decent roster. And it's because they're coming in to play Irvine here in a few weeks. So <laughs> had, had to study them a little bit. So I'd ask about Jay's, but I mean, Jay's just been kind of hanging out alone in his house, you know, no matches. And that's why he's so like light and feathery right now. And mm -hmm. actually in a very optimistic mood. <laughs> Optimistic is a subjective term. Um, <laughs> I, I, I found it funny, you know, in Kevin Barnett-esque ways, somebody on Volley Talk said that uh, CSUN had lost to a golf tournament, which I thought was quite a, kind of funny. <laughs> uh, and in the in their Volley Talk rankings, you know, and listen, I, I pay attention to what they say only because it's fun. It's not because I, I put a lot of value behind it, but Somebody had put like, you know, golf tournament, you know, Pebble Beach and a couple other ones. So I thought that was kind of funny. But, you know, the reality is uh, Theo hit it right on the head. NEI has eight scholarships or at least up two. And when men's NCAA Division One only has four and a half uh, and the requirements are much more stringent with Division One because NCAA has certain requirements about eligibility and about, um, you know, professionalism and this and that. NAI does not have those things. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a, a, a fallback, if you will, for foreign students who want to get an education, but still want to compete and maybe have played a year uh, professionally or maybe were, you know, associated with a pro team, maybe a little bit older. Um, and the foreign requirements are a little bit less strict and these schools can kind of go around the, you know, work, have a workaround. But the quality of the top, I don't know, five to eight NAI programs is really good. If you watch any of those teams play, you'd be like, wow, that's that's impressive. And there's a lot of NCAA schools. And I give Theo a lot of credit on this. I don't know if I would do it. They schedule those teams. And, <laughs> you know, when a team like Northridge, who is historically known as a strong Division One team, loses to a non-traditional, if you will, name-wise school like the Masters, people raise eyebrows. But the coaches all know that's not – that's not the case. It's not a ginormous upset. It's they're a good team. They, they're coached well. Jerry Goldberg uh, does a great job out there. Um, and, you know, Brian Rofer is coaching at Vanguard. And there's all these coaches that, you know, know what they're doing. And they're getting these kids that are already kind of competitive ready. Uh, and they play at a high level. So kudos to them. And, you know, Theo lick his wounds a little bit. But it won't be long before they're back on the winning trail. And, you know, it is what it is. I remember a program back in the day by the name of Cal Baptist University yep. who used to come in and beat the snot as Jay would say out of a lot of D one, two teams, but you look at their roster, they have Venezuelans, they have Dominicans. They've got so many international pieces of talent that would come in and just beat the tar out of you. <laughs> I was, uh, I was talking to one of our players the other day, one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And I have not seen it done since Cal Baptist was playing at BYU or BYU at home. They had a player on the roster named Shamzu. Now, Shamzu, I believe, came from Ghana. And if I'm wrong, I... And he lives in Costa Mesa, California now. Nice. I ran into him. So Shamzu serves a ball. BYU 
overpasses the ball. Shamsu played opposite, ran into the court and attacked it and got a kill. It was unreal. I've never seen anything like it. So, uh, yeah, there's some good players at that level. Don't overlook them. If you ever see one of them starting to play some D1 teams on a regular basis, they're fun to watch. Yeah. Well, uh, our next topic, usually Dan would be in here to really promote his MEVA conference. But what I think is happening in the MEVA is interesting. You have a slew of two and one teams because of teams beating each other. Expected, unexpected. But, I mean, if we we're going off the polls, I'd say, oh, those are upsets. But we know that the talent in the MEVA is definitely going deeper. And we're seeing those upsets happen or quote unquote upsets, but I want to get your guys thoughts on the teams that are two and one. That's uh, five teams. OS Ohio state, Lewis, Loyola, ball state, and McKendry. And that's uh Brad. Yeah. Thoughts? So, I mean, right. You've seen Ohio state, Lewis, Loyola, they've kind of become staples in the MEVA, you know, and I think now with Donan at ball state, um, has kind of edged his way into that upper echelon in terms of consistency. And I think McKendry, I think all the coaches in the MEVA and really across the country know what Nikki's doing at McKendry and um, the program she's building. And then they already had a pretty good base from last year, but then they added a couple of players from the transfer portal, one from Pepperdine, Libero from Pepperdine, and then a middle from Central State, and maybe one other, um, but all pieces that they really needed. Um, to fit in and they've gotten them in and they've been playing great and I think they have a fifth year senior setting they have two really physical pin hitters um, you know to where I think we're seeing a lot less uh, power imbalances throughout that conference um, and a lot more randomness on who's going to be winning all those matches and the schedule obviously doesn't help for the consistency sake and um, but I think it's great that you look at the top of their standings and you see five teams, two and one, and like thinking about all the upcoming matches they're going to have and how interesting it's going to be and who we want to watch and who's going to be playing. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's it's great for volleyball. It's great for the MEVA. And, and it's really fun not in that conference to get just sit back and watch. Yeah. Anyone else on screen want to jump on? Yeah, I, I, ones. I, I think, uh, you know, first off, I want to give a shout out to Nikki Sandlin. Uh, she recently got promoted. So she's an associate or assistant athletic director, also the director of volleyball uh, for McKinder University. And for those that know, she's been had incredible success, both as the head women's and head men's coach. Um, and for any of the coaches that have ever done that, where you're in season year round, obviously, that's no longer what she's doing. But it is a grind and she has been incredibly successful in, in many facets. Want to give her a quick shout out. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we, uh, you know, Brad hit it on the head, the, the competition, the, the parody that we're seeing in the Miva is, is pretty cool. And, you know, I think the, the surprising one, the shocker is the McKendry win over ball state. Um, but Brad talked about this a little bit, the, the scheduling that's happening in the Miva. I have talked to a couple of different coaches I don't understand it. it. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know why you would do this. Both putting the, obviously the coaches, uh, you know, and and the teams under this type of stress. But when you start to talk about student athletes, right? And these guys, these guys got to travel and they're going, they're going, these are not small distances. They're going long distances, playing three matches in one week and, and trying to stay physically healthy, I mean, the demands of this are re are pretty outrageous. And why the scheduling is the way it is, there must be something I don't understand about it. Um, but it but it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But it is going to lead to a lot more of this, I think. Um, it, it's difficult as it is to stay consistent night in and night out. But to have three matches and, and you know, situations where you're playing your starters and all three – um, you know, one week to the next week, that three match week, the week before might be affecting you for the next two following weeks. And so it's, uh, it's really, really interesting, but at the same time to see McKendry get a win like that, obviously Loyola to knock off Ohio state, that five setter was absolutely thrilling. Super, super exciting. Uh, just some really, really great volleyball being played. Well, I, I also have talked to a few coaches, um, just two points I want to make, but the first point is their response to me was there were a there's nine teams in that conference so you take the same amount of weeks that everybody else has and granted they started a little bit earlier than some of the other ones 
but they have to fill a large amount of matches. And they all talked about there was a few coaches that wanted equality in terms of having teams in their gym and going to other gyms. There didn't want to be any inequality in terms of, well, this team has more home matches and this team has this team in their gym this year. Why don't we have them? So they said, okay, well, then this is what we're going to do. And I don't know if it's going to be that case moving forward. Um, I know some coaches have expressed some dissatisfaction with it. You're right, Theo. It takes away from the student athlete experience in terms of being on campus and, and being fresh and, you know, getting their studies done on time and it, it puts a big strain on them. So uh, I would be interested to see how that goes moving forward uh, and, and for how long, because when the GLVC breaks off and teams break off and all of a sudden teams are going their own way and now all of a sudden it might shrink a little bit. The other thing is, is that the MEVA is a microcosm of what's going on across the country. Everybody is meeting everybody and everybody is vulnerable. I know that Grand Canyon is undefeated. They're coming up against their meat of the season now. I don't think they're going to be undefeated for very long. Secondly, I mean, look at UCLA losing to Santa Barbara, who is barely in the top 20 this year and, and at UCLA's home. And, and, and look at schools like Long Beach and look at schools like Stanford and look at schools like White. There's all these matches that are being won and lost by teams that maybe are not uh, at the top of the rankings, so to speak, but they're beating you. And I think this year is going to be exciting because anyone can literally beat anybody with the exception of Grand Canyon right now uh, on any given night. And that's fun for the average fan. So I think it's just a microcosm. It's happening across the country. And I think one other piece with the schedule and the Miva is, you know, like you look at the schedule from last week and you had Loyola and Purdue four Wayne. they played on a Tuesday and then Ohio State Lewis are playing on a Wednesday, like, from a watching perspective, it's hard to get to watch some of those marquee matches, you know, to where Friday, Saturday, it's really easy to watch UCLA and Long Beach State, you know, and as we want to promote our game, it's how do we highlight and emphasize these marquee matchups? Ohio State and Lewis is a marquee matchup every single year, and that needs to be played on a Friday or Saturday, you know, and I'm sure Birch and Dan are in similar boats, but uh yeah, you're probably going to see you're probably going to see a lot more Saturday and Sunday afternoon games happen if that is the way that we go. And I agree with you, Brad. It, it's you know we we should have some days that are set aside that are absolute no brainers. Uh, occasionally, there's going to be the midweek match, and I think that mostly will happen or should happen uh, on the West Coast, where schools are an hour away from each other. That makes total sense. But hey, look, it's uh it's cool pilot guy coming on. <laughs> <laughs> but i think i think that's just the way that it goes um and for now until things shift in the future cpg on the screen cpg <laughs> that's unfortunate dan's best looking coach in the amoebas dropped down to third from first from five years ago i know we're, we've been talking about that since he opened his segment here uh, dan so <laughs> welcome dan friend hey, coach I, I don't think i, I want to know who's wanted to then because you haven't well, seen we're jumped out so <laughs> <laughs> and I don't Nikki's think he's up there now dressed too. up at home, Rob. Just so you know, I think uh, Jake Jake could speak of that. He's he was at my place too. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, we actually were talking about your conference, Dan. That you know, there's a slew of two and one teams, and the competition has been really good because we saw a, a few top upsets, some unexpected results. We'll call them uh, early on here, and uh, we you know obviously we think it's me. It's been a good battle so far in the Miva. Yeah, I think it's going to be a gauntlet continuously as it goes through the the season. So I don't think anybody's walking into anywhere with a a mind frame where like, hey, this is an easy win uh, for me at, at any given moment. So I think, uh, yeah, Queens and Quincy have some pieces that are in there doing some really nice things. And so, and you saw Lindenwood almost get out and get Ball State. So uh, you know, and an overtime game there as well at the same time. And so, uh, yep. Well, we were talking about the uh, <clears throat> 2.0 logo for Lewis. Now you're known as not the uh, the the Dan Aliens, but the Cool Pilot Guys. <laughs> That's, That's your new nickname, by the way, Dan. Cool Pilot Guy. Cool Pilot Earth Guy. Class Officer Dan Friend. Uh, <laughs> all right, I, I I like that better. I can stick with that. That'll work. <laughs> we might well, have to now. We got to change it. If you like it, we got to change it. <laughs> I, I hate for me to like something that would be horrible dude. <laughs> so well, we actually mentioned matt worley but his team is the last remaining undefeated they were off this week at 10 and 0 grand canyon 
Um, I thought I'd throw it in our elephant in the room segment. Well, one, because Jay dropped it, but I couldn't fit anywhere else in there. So, um, but with Grand Canyon being the last undefeated team, I know some of the discussion is, oh, they still had a, a, a schedule that wasn't up to par. And I'm like, uh, our discussion is how much better the play is getting around the nation and they are beating those teams. So um, they got a, a really good pieces in place and Gianni and a former Lewis guy and Hickman and Rico Wardlow. And we've all been talking about Nick Slight setter for the uh, Lopes and um, they're going to have a big matchup coming this weekend at BYU. And uh, I engaged some conversation on a social media feed. I'm like, well, you know, thanks to Theo who dropped that stat line, BYU wins 92% of their home matches. Like, oh, it doesn't matter, was the response. I'm like, it does matter. <laughs> so uh, we're kind of going into our next week uh, portion of like what we're watching, but um, thoughts on where Grand Canyon's at and the matchup at Provo. And uh, you know, since Dan's a freshman on, we'll throw him on first. I'm really excited for this match. I think it's, uh, it's a, it'll be a great test. Uh uh, for GCU and BYU has been steadily playing better and better volleyball. Do you know what I mean? In terms of that. And so uh, they both have some really good pieces. So I expect it to, I could see them splitting, honestly, like I could see them going in there and uh, you know, losing maybe the first night and then winning the second night. But I, I think uh, it's going to be some great volleyball to watch. And so the, I mean, GCU is a talented, fast physical team with good arms, but does our serve get a little neutralized in the BYU air. <laughs> it's not a thing. Not a, that's why I said that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Who wants to jump in on the topic? Uh, the undefeated Lopes. I will jump in quickly because I'll be fast. Um, obviously, Grand Canyon is 9-0, and I believe, is their record. They're yeah. rightfully so. I think what they should be commended for and what a lot of us as coaches have seen over the years, when you have a good team and sometimes you play a team that maybe is not at your caliber – some teams tend to dip a little bit when they play teams like that because they feel they can coast through it. His team is not dipping at all. They're playing at a high clip the entire time. Uh, this will be their, you know, the, the the where the meat of the season starts to kick in. And I, I too, think uh, it's going to be one to watch this weekend. I think Grand Canyon's going to win both, though. Ooh, look at that. Yeah. Uh, I I, I think that I think that the the nice thing is is that week after week there's been a lot of rumble on volley talk or what you have about whether or not their schedule is tough. And the nice thing is it that part's over. Uh, they're from here on out, they're gonna play tough, talented teams every single night and and uh, and I think it's gonna be really fun. This Grand Canyon team is fantastic and they're undefeated for a reason. They're really, really good. and they are going to, win both at BYU. You heard it here first. But no, I said it first. <laughs> I think I said it last week when we were confused. Where, where's my red flag? Do I need to no, show no, no. the video that no, I no, said no. it first? Jay, Brad did say it last week, but so did I. <laughs> um, For Grand Canyon, I think what's going to be interesting is they're not like a traditional team in terms of the sense of they serve in a good bit. Like I think they're airing on the season about like 13, 14%. Um, so that serving in aspect. And, you know, I think BYU has, from what I've seen, they've done a couple different lineups with their four pin hitters, figured out how they're going to get the best passers onto the court. So I think that's a, that's an advantage that Grand Canyon can really um, utilize and take advantage of. And then we obviously, you know, I've spoken a lot about Nick slide and he's, one of, if not the best setter in the country right now, and being able to serve in and then having a setter who's going to run your offense that effectively, I think that sets them up for a lot of success. And the real test will be Grand Canyon and their second outside hitter, whether it be Carter Rogers or or Palmer. Um, they've been kind of split in time in both those spots is how that um, last spot on their court fills in because everything else in that roster and in that rotation is pretty well set. Um, so I think the real key will be how Grand Canyon handles serve receive um, with a new libero and that second outside hitter. And that will be um, deciding if Grand Canyon ends up winning two in five as I see them both going down um, or not. Yeah. What's going on next topic for the week? Upset bug is still biting. We've kind of alluded to it in our previous conversation, and we've already spoken about the screaming eagles over the Tritons and 
the uh, Masters of the Matadors, but we have to go to other ones here. Uh, February 9th, uh, Lincoln Memorial receiving votes in the top 20 over number 10 Princeton early on. You know, we've, we've said, got to watch Lincoln Memorial, but how did they get it done? And who wants to jump in on the screen? I so will, because I know I talked to Sam yesterday. Um, you know, the injury bug does have an effect. And you've, you've seen across the country, every team at their best. And when they're missing their one go-to player for a match or two, they're all of a sudden, as a, as one of our old good friends, Brad Kelly used to say, they become dead medium. Uh, and <laughs> it's nothing more than just the depth, I think, is what's going to start to separate some teams. Some of these teams, like Princeton, uh, like Stanford, uh, like a couple of others, they're, they're not as deep as maybe people had thought or maybe the coaches had thought. And all of a sudden, the bre- the backup comes on and uh, doesn't perform at the level that maybe the starter does. I think this is where the UCLA's and the Long Beach States of the world are going to start to separate themselves as the season wears on because their depth is just rel- ridiculous. The last time I checked, I think Long Beach State has 48 guys on their roster uh, and 73 red shirts. Uh, and that's uh, it's an NCAA record. Go ahead and check it. Um, <laughs> but that's but that's the case. And and that's OK. I mean, I, I, I'm glad these these teams are, are figuring out ways to win. And some of the teams are taking advantage of those situations. And that's fun. And, you know, it is what it is. Everybody's going to have something. Nobody has a season where nothing happens. So good for them for, for trying to figure it out and good for the other teams for taking advantage of it. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in? No, I, I just I know think Wedbush it, makes a huge difference for Princeton. I think it looks like everyone else kind of was playing, just losing that season setter in Henry Wedbush um, makes a huge difference. But I think the silver lining is, as you look at building that depth for as they get into conference play, is, you know, now they have a young setter in Joe Kelly who's getting some experience and getting a couple matches under his belt. And granted, they didn't go their way, uh, but that definitely helps build that depth over time. Um, for for a program and for young setters or young players at any position. Yeah, I think the other match when they uh, lost to Sacred Heart, they were out their setter and a libero. Yep. Um, so I just like, I mean, first and second touch. <laughs> so uh, makes it makes things a lot different. And so, uh, but yeah, nothing again away from the programs though that are winning. So I think uh, Lincoln Morrow took advantage, Sacred Heart took advantage, and we saw Sacred Heart beat NJIT too. You know what I mean in terms of that, and so, yeah. um, so I think a lot of parody. You're gonna, that's not the end of the upsets. We keep we're going to be saying upset every single week, just so you know. So, <laughs> Make yeah. sure good at promotion, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with that, let's jump over to McKendry over Ball State, and uh, one stat line that stuck out for me. I didn't put it in your guys' notes when I sent it out to you, but Tina Ishii and Davos Acheva basically was neutralized, and I I'm curious how that happened because. He had, uh, like, pulled it up here. Uh, hold on for a second. Four kills, four errors on 15 attempts, hit zero. With what I've seen him playing, that just doesn't seem possible. But I wanted to get your guys' take on that matchup and uh, what happened with McKendry. Who wants well, to jump in? I'm going to give some props that, I mean, Kevin Shuley plays for McKendry, and he's really good. He had a double-double. Um you know, he was really good against us, and they're leading our conference. I think McKendry is in digs per game, so uh, I'm not surprised they made it a challenge for uh, him to get some kills and uh, have the ability to neutralize him a little bit. I think they're going to do that to a few teams because defense is certainly their strong suit. The unique piece is they had a kid come in named Sam Hoskins, which is, um, for some of these guys, Dean Hoskins' son, who's an official out of Chicago but then moved to Phoenix. So, uh Awesome to see his kid get 15 kills and hit 480. Do you know what I mean in terms of that? So, uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, I thought McHenry took an advantage and uh, played to their strengths. So, all right, anyone else on screen about the McHenry over number 11 ball state matchup? Just passing and defense was the factors. I mean, a lot better in serve receiving, a lot better on defense in that match. Good call. Let's move over to another match on that same evening. Number 13 Loyola over number six. Ohio State, and uh, I feel like I should go to Theo on this one. I feel like he's got some deep to share here. Yeah, I mean, I had a I had a conversation actually with Hawks uh, over the weekend, and uh, he, you know, he essentially was just really impressed with his guys. 
and thought that they've had kind of a they've had a, a few peak moments and you know we talked about this early in the year they they scheduled one of the most difficult road swings in the beginning of this season uh where they went to Hawaii and then made their way to obviously to the west coast and and played Stanford and and they, I mean they really had a, a really tough go at it in the beginning and those things are starting to pay off the experience is starting to pay off um and when they, when it came to this match they they had their eyes on it and they were incredibly excited for it. And they had some guys really step up and make some big plays. And, you know, I, I don't know, looking at it, you're, you know, 13 over six, like you can call it an upset, but like those two teams are really similar in a lot of ways. And, and sometimes having that little bit of an edge of having the home court advantage um, can make a big difference. Uh, But also just who's got it that night. And sometimes, you know, that that's where it comes down to, and especially when you when you're talking about a five setter. But the the thing that I thought was interesting were the scores of set four and five. Uh, Loyola really, really took it to him and took control of that match. And so um, it was a really, really nice win for them. And, and uh, I, again, more parity for men's volleyball. 25-14 was the set four score, 15-5 in the fifth for all you wondering what that score was. And, yeah, I looked at that. I serving. watched it. It was all – I mean, they just – they they really got Ohio State in trouble, like on some serving stuff and seam stuff. And so I think Loyal really did a nice job with that. Since we're playing Loyal Wednesday, I, I might know. Good, I mean. <laughs> well, and the, and the other thing is what we've been talking about a lot, Michael Wright wasn't setting for Ohio State. And so it'll be interesting to see – if Michael Wright's in that match, is it the same outcome? And and man, Hawks's guys are are humming right now. So no no slam against them or no slide against them whatsoever about you know beating a team without him on there. But, but would it be the same? I, I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's that's a great match. It was fun to watch. I watched it too. Because you know I was off this weekend. So <laughs> I think he hurt his knee in our match. Uh, Michael did so on Wednesday. They had uh, Parker Van Buren, as always, leading the way for Loyola. Had uh, 17 kills at 382, but it's uh, Daniel Fabakovich, 11 kills. That's also doing some damage to uh, the other teams. So, and you'd look at Loyola and their record, 7 6, like, oh, they're not so good, but they're putting up a fight <laughs> in a lot of their matches that they're losing in. And they do have a victory over Hawaii. So, can't overlook that. So, Anything else on the Loyola over Ohio State matchup, guys? No, okay. Um, on the next evening, on the tenth, Queens over number twenty PFW. Uh, who wants to jump in on that one? I, I talked to Rock yesterday, and uh, he uh, was not satisfied with his team's mental uh, status going in, and by that, uh, I think PFW. Looked at Queens, obviously, as a conference match, but I'm not sure that they gave the due diligence where it was due. Uh, in Queens, listen, they're, they've got something to prove. You know, they're a recently transitioned Division One team. They're in a conference that's got some really strong teams in it. They want to prove themselves worthy of the of the task, and and they came out and handed it to them. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you right now, if you're overlooking Queens just because of the name or because of the recent history, you're not doing yourself a service because they're good. They got a they got a setter who can run that ball around. They got a couple of players that can slap it around. They're good and they're scrappy. Yeah, and then and they're like the Lincoln Memorials. They're like the Charlestons. They're like the Northridges of the world. They got a massive chip on their shoulder. Those are tough teams to beat, especially at home. Jay, were all these conversations yesterday were those on the record or off the record? Or you know, I I always uh, kind of gloss over that when I'm talking to them, but, <laughs> but never disclose anything that's that's uh, that's you know too close to the vest, so to speak. I do think Queens was down in the fifth game by six or seven, and had to come out and make a run. They made like an was it they had to make like an eight to two run or nine to two run uh, yep. in terms of that. So it was a pretty big flip in that game. So yep, they were down eleven to four. Wow. <sighs> Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Eleven four in the fifth. <laughs> wow. Um, I, can, I can see why Rock might, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stings, man. Brutal. <laughs> well, uh Queens, uh, anything else on Queens over PFW? Because uh what brings us to our 
one of the most highly watched matchups during the week. UCLA, Long Beach State at the home and home, started at Long Beach on night one, ended at Westwood on night two. Um, was What did we learn from that split series between the two teams? And uh, I'm sure there's plenty to say. So uh, let's go with, let's start off with uh, Brad on this one, and then we'll go over to Dan, and then we'll go across the top of my screen to Theo, then Jay. Okay. I mean, it was two heavyweights going after it. And, you know, I think the big thing that stands out, and it's not a shock to us here, um, but both these teams are good and the margins are so small, right? And they played eight sets of volleyball, UCLA in four, then Long Beach in four, or vice versa. Okay. 390 points were scored. 194 scored by Long Beach, 196 scored by UCLA. <laughs> and that just shows you how thin those margins are. That's less than 1% difference. And it's little things here and there, um, the blocking subs, the serving subs, all of those are going to add up to make those difference, you know? So if and when these teams maybe end up playing in May, it's going to be do sets. It's going to be really close and it can go either way. You know, and I think that was what stood out is just reemphasizing how thin these margins are uh, for each and every team. And it's like that in a lot of other matches too, but I think it, it really stood out in, uh, in this uh, marquee matchup this week. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you got one and two right now. I, I'm not negating Grand Canyon or Hawaii, but I honestly think, you know, uh, where we're at right now, the snapshot, and I'll be eager to see, uh, you know, Long Beach and Hawaii play and Grand Canyon and uh, UCLA play. But, I, but yeah, it was some great volleyball. And, you know, both teams took care of home, which, oh, I always think plays into a couple points at the same time, do you know what I mean, in terms of that. So. Go over to Theo. Yeah, I <laughs> – I, I, you know, I, we talk about this from time to time. These guys hit hit a lot of the stats on the head, but the depth of some of these teams happens to tend to be the difference. And for for UCLA, Ito David had an off night, hits negative negative three sixty four. Uh, they bring in Grant Sloan and uh, Grant Sloan, who has not necessarily had a, a huge presence in the stat sheets uh, this year yet. I mean, he was fantastic and hit 583 on 24 swings, 16 kills. Um, Alex Knight back to the left, and they're now Ethan Champlin's is looking like that's going to be their libero moving forward. Um, I mean, this team is so talented that they've won and lost big games with multiple different rosters. And I think there are very few teams in collegiate Division One men's volleyball that are doing that. Um, that to me is the one big significant difference with this UCLA group. And, um, but to Brad's point for, for John Spira and for that staff, they are making changes to find two, three, four point differentials. And it is so small, the, the, the margin of difference between these teams and to come away with the victory. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting more and more challenging and, uh, just great for great for volleyball, great for the sport. And I'm excited to see these two teams play again because I think we will see it at some point in May. Ooh, Theo calling it early. <laughs> Over to Jay. Well, actually, I know the real skinny of why those teams uh switched. It's the rough and rugged drive on the 405 freeway. You know, without traffic, it's 30 minutes, but I heard that there was a styrofoam cup in the road. <laughs> There was a homeless man uh, putting up a tent on the side of the freeway and it slowed it down to a, to a 55 minute commute, which has huge impacts. I mean, and it, it, it took e-bikes. He took e-bikes when, there's up a naked homeless, when there's a naked homeless man on the side of the 405 freeway, slowing everything down, that's going to throw your game off. No, <laughs> I, I think these guys hit it. The, uh, the reality is this, the margins for error are so slim. And on the opposite side of that, how good can you play for long periods of time? And both those teams have shown they can do it for a long time. Uh, and I think that's going to what's what's separating them from the, the bottom half of the top 20 is their ability to play for 30, 40, 50, 60 points in a row without faltering or making many mistakes. 
that's that's unheard of. Uh, and that's going to be the difference maker. And I, I just got an update. Last I heard, Long Beach State has 58 guys now <laughs> rostered. And they just recruited and had two guys come in early. So they now have 75 red shirts. So <laughs> they literally just pulled them in the last 20 minutes. <laughs> You're on the Twitter feed, huh? The X feed. I am. Getting I'm getting all the feeds. I'm getting it all. <laughs> so I'm going to throw some names out there because I was watching both matches uh, with my multiple screens. It was actually a good weekend to have a kid six. I can have watch everything at the same time. But uh, Satirish Shapani's uh, such a talented outside hitter. So many balls. Well, actually, not so many, but whenever he received the ball out of system, 15, 20 feet off the net, he still found a way to get the kill on the point. And what he's doing on defense behind the block is phenomenal. He's he's, he's a freak. Um, the way that he's keeping Long Beach in those extended rallies and winning them, I mean, that's a boost to the team's momentum. But, I mean, he provides so much energy based on his gameplay. And I also got to add in Mason Briggs. And we don't mention him enough because I think everyone ex expects that of him. But when you watch closely each of those matches, what he does to keep Long Beach in the play and in serve-receive, they're hard to beat. <clears throat> then on the UCLA side, Alex Knight, you know, doesn't play a whole bunch first night, comes in, gets kills. Alex Knight comes in second night, and he's he's leading the way. So, And Grant Sloan off the bench, great uh, role player. But to come in, as Theo said, hits over, what, three-something, a five-something, was it? 583. On 16 points. kills, two errors. Not bad for an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that old junior from Irvine, California. Yes, that's a that's an old guy. So uh, not to be confused Theo... with the cool pilot guy. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I mean, it's as Theo called, could be seeing these two teams in the postseason. So, uh, and I'm sure that each team will be even better. Which will go to our other match. USC over UC Irvine, or actually USC versus UC Irvine, and that was a painful one for me. <laughs> but uh, night one was good, night two not so much, but good for USC. And uh, want to get your guys' thoughts on the match. It's fifth, number fifteen USC splitting the series with number seven UC Irvine. Let's go. Let's go reverse direction. Jay first. Did they drive the four hundred five on the way up and down? Because <laughs> that I would be they the snuck down one hundred one five over fifty five. Two, yeah, uh, four or five south to 50, 73. Yeah, I, I think I think what's I think the only thing for me though, stick out, and I'll be quick here, is that UC Irvine right now is kind of like this. They're, they're they're having really good nights, really not good nights, really good sets, really not good sets. Uh, and 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 that's, you know, Nip is is looking around and seeing who's going to be the guy that can that can take the charge. But the reality is that they're both pretty evenly matched teams, so it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, Theo. Yeah, I think I, these teams are really, really, really similar in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, again, kind of coming back to who's going to be a little bit more consistent. I think the in the night that that USC won, Irvine had 51 kills, USC had 50, right? And they hit one hit 250, the other hit 265. A lot of these stats are really, really similar, um, but coming down to kind of the end and, and Dylan Klein, who took 39 swings, 17 kills, 359, had 19 points and I mean, was an absolute force. And I think Hilaire Heno is kind of like the counterpart to that, right? Like he kind of has the same skill sets, uh, maybe a little bit better server where Dylan might be a little bit in the attacking side. And, um, but to see that USC team bounce back and, and find a way to knock them off again, an upset, maybe right by numbers, but two really, really great teams going at it and uh, you know, really exciting volleyball. All right, Brad. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, these guys hit a lot of it, but I think the one thing that stands out, you know, at what led to USC having some success and getting a win against Irvine um, is Heno had zero aces. And at whatever he's at for his career ace record, um, and it'll keep building, but I think that's a huge piece of what Irvine's doing and, and their success. And being able to limit that and take those away, um is huge well and brad to add he had six service errors with zero aces which is unheard of for him normal for anyone else uh any other <laughs> of our guys but, uh unheard of for him and and the funny part is he still hit over 400 and had what 
42 kills on the uh, <laughs> on the weekend. <laughs> and it's those two or three little points that we're used to him getting every single match from the end line. Um, that can be the difference between them winning in four or losing in four. And we'll close out with Dan. <clears throat> I would just say uh, Hino needed some help on the second night. I mean, we know he's going to get his production night in and night out. But, like, uh, I think uh, Jay said it. You see Irvine a little bit up and down. I mean, you kind of know the pieces, you know, for USC uh, between Wes and Dylan. But, like, you don't always know the pieces uh, with Irvine with Hino right now. So, I think if he gets a couple of those pieces to level out consistently, uh, I think Irvine takes that next step as a program. So, yeah. Well, I think it's interesting too, Dan, like the compare and contrast of UCLA and Irvine in the sense that Irvine made some subs, bring in William Darcy, right? Darcy plays four sets, has 22 swings, six kills, five errors, only hits 045. And right. so to have to have someone who's coming off the bench or maybe changing roles and not perform in the same facets that we're seeing UCLA do, um, that depth is such a struggle, right? It's a struggle at this level for most teams and trying to have additional guys come in and provide that same high level performance is, is really challenging. Yeah. Well, with that, the final match is uh, Harvard over LMU after, or Lincoln Memorial after they beat Princeton. So, but uh, well, the, uh, the results again, the parody in uh, division one, two volleyball this year, <clears throat> we're behind on time, but I wanted to get, I'm going to split the topic with you guys. I'm hoping I'll pick the right pair for each of them, but the two topics are the Hawaiian Hurton. On Stanford, they had the Stanford was out in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii took both, and then Pepperdine taking both of the PCH series against UC Santa Barbara. Let's go with uh, I won't make make the Big West guys uh, put them on the pressure here, but uh, let's do. You guys can do the uh, Pepperdine and UC Santa Barbara, and Jay and Dan can do the Hawaii Stanford. So let's start with you guys, Theo and Brad, with the uh, Hawaii Hurton. Go ahead, Brad. Wait, we're talking about hey, Hawaii or Pepperdine? Hey, yeah. You screwed it up, Rob. Oh, I screwed up. Sorry. Hey, Pepperdine, uh, Pepperdine and UC Santa Barbara. <laughs> That's uh, Theo and Brad. Got it. You got me confused there. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the coming out party for Cole Kaczynski, um is what really stood out to me. He uh, he played great. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, but he played really, really well. Uh, Finally, I think the one piece that Pepperdine has been really kind of looking for and striving to find is that consistency, killing the ball and attacking uh, out of the pin hitters uh, for them this season, you know, and Cole being able to do that against Santa Barbara, that's going to be a good blocking, scrappy defensive team, as we always know with Rick. Um, so seeing that was really, really big and and seeing them really kind of, you know, went on the road and then went at home and solidify it um, really is a, uh, a good test for Pepperdine as they head into the conference play. That yeah, Kuczynski, 16 kills. I'm sorry. Uh, 19, 19 kills, one, one error, 600, three block assists, four digs and 20.5 points. So good call. Theo. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, Brad, Brad went over and I watched that first match, the one, the five setter uh, that Pepperdine ended up knocking them off at, at Santa Barbara. And, uh, and that was a really interesting one, right? Like Bianchi, who we saw early in the year, I mean, was just has been really dominant. Um, instead, they had Reese Barnett in there, who also another really great opposite, good lefty player. Um, he had 18 kills. I don't know what his hitting percentage was, but he scored 19 points, but it just wasn't quite enough. And and down the stretch in some crucial points, uh, Pepperdine made some nice changes. And you could tell early on in that match that they were kind of feeling each other out and changing points and, um, starting to see who was kind of going to win that serve and pass battle. And then coming into night two, I think it's really interesting when you see Pepperdine kind of start to take hold of that. And, you know, where that first that first match, it really felt like those teams were were evenly matched in a lot of ways. And it was just kind of who could sustain the runs the longest and or avoid the runs. And and then Cole has that incredible performance, 19 kills, 600. He was damn near unstoppable. And uh, it seemed to me like right from set one, like Pepperdine set the tone and had a 15, 25 to 16 win. And from that point on, it felt like they were going to be in control of the match and, and they were able to close it out in three. So really exciting volleyball. But I, I you know, I thought that uh, it, does anybody know what's going on with Bianchi and, and where he's at in terms of lineup perspective, or are they just giving Reese a chance or. 
No, but I wish he would have had that problem. We played him earlier in the year. <laughs> yeah, he had his coming out party against against George Mason, man. He he would every <laughs> you had the uh, the old uh, who's going to stop Wilt conversation with your team, huh? <laughs> yeah, I had that conversation for sure. <laughs> And like another teacher. guy for uh, Pepperdine, another new face, or I don't think anyone we've talked about, got subbed in. Ethan Watson, middle blocker from the Bay Area, um, came in. What, on the weekend, he hit over 600, 23 kills. So, impressive weekend for a young middle blocker there for the Waves. All right, let's jump over to the Hawaiian Hurton against Stanford this weekend. That's going to be Jay and Dan, who wants to jump in on that one first. Yeah, did Stanford take the four hundred five when they went out to? Uh, <laughs> I think I think for me, um, we talk about BYU's win percentage at home. I'd be interested to see what Hawaii's win percentage is at home. Uh, I think it's vastly different than when they're on the road, um, and and vastly, it's not like you know nine fifty compared to one fifty. It's not that that vast, but I think it's noticeable. Uh, Hawaii is very good at home. They're a very good team this year. They have arguably one of the best young centers to come through uh, in ages, uh, and he's getting lots of experience. Um, and they got a couple guys around him, Voss and, and Hawkus, that know how to know how to get it done. I think the real question mark will be: Will Galloway be able to su sustain a high level of play throughout the entire season? Uh, and if not him, then who's going to step up around him? And that's going to be the fun part. Well, Jay, I have to say that's going to be Alakai Todd, who's been on fire at the opposite position. Um, and he's been, he's had zero error nights. He's had one error nights, but he's definitely getting double digits kills. And wherever Galloway or whoever the OH2 is that's playing, uh, Alakai Todd's picking up that that slack. Yeah. And, and will Alakai be able to sustain that knowing that everybody's got a huge giant bullseye around that guy? Uh, that will be the question. Because Vo listen, Voss is very, very good, but he's only in there for three rotations. And if you beat him off the net, then all of a sudden you take him out. Um, you know, Alakai uh, could be the guy that they lean on in those situations. But when he is the focal point against a really good blocking team, could that be a little bit of a challenge? But he's proven himself to be good so far. So no reason to believe he can't. Yeah. Dan. Um, uh, so I'm going to throw in there. Rotman's still not out there, just so you guys know. So like, uh, yep. you know, the one brother was back, but Will's not back. And so, but here, like Hawaii, like I think uh, Spiros has to be up for player of the year. Like you go look at his stats overall and what he's doing right now. Like I'd be curious to see him compared to some of the other guys if Hawaii makes a run in terms of statistics. So he's certainly leading that team and leading it very effective uh, from that standpoint. And there is a little balance with Todd on the opposite side. And I, I think the guy you talk about too is Tread. You know, you got a 17-year-old, 18-year-old kid coming in there running the program, and he keeps getting a little bit better each week and does a ton of serving pressure and does some really nice things. And um, how will he play as he travels in the conference and road travel and all that stuff? That'll be the other piece with that uh, and how they kind of, you know, level out as they get into the conference play. But uh, kudos to those guys. Stanford's talented, and costi has got those guys playing well. But you get Rotman back in there, I think um, – It'll be interesting to see kind of where that goes. So hopefully he's back on the court pretty soon. Yeah, Hawaii is playing with their uh, the pedal to the metal, so to speak. Uh, one of the scores, 25-7 on one of the nights. And, uh, you know, they've been, although people have been saying, oh, they, they're not playing very tough teams. Well, they're playing like they're playing the tough teams. And they are not slowing down at all, which, I mean, they've got to get the right mentality come those other tougher matches in the, the year or the more challenging ones. So. Um, with that, let's look at our picks of the week. Uh, who likes to steal? Who doesn't like to steal? Brad's been known to be the closet stealer, but you know, we'll start with Jay on this one. You can go one or two, your choice. Or there's like quite a no, few. No, 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 no. I'm going with 22, and you'll hear why in a second. First, <laughs> first is Cole Katrinsky 19 kills, one air, hit 600 in his win versus Santa Barbara. That was that's an unbelievable performance. Number two. Heno with the shoot over set on one on the serve for the kill against USC. And everybody in the country was up in arms. Oh, he attacked the serve. He can't do that. No, everybody. He can because he was below the top of the tape. And it's just like an overpass. He just happened to shoot it over. Good for him for breaking the internet on that day. But here's my real one. Ready for this? All 20 
players at Queens University being down 4-11 in the fifth and refused to go down without a fight and took it to PFW to win that match at home. They are the players of the week for me. I'm not going to design that graphic. I'm wrong. <laughs> <that. laughs> You're just going to have to use the Queens logo next to all the heads. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Get creative on that one. Let's jump over to Dan. Uh, I got two guys, uh, uh, Sparrows from Hawaii and Kevin Shuley from McHenry. Uh, so two guys that were pretty instrumental uh, in their teams uh, getting some uh, victories. So, All right, go over to – we'll go to Brad so he can maybe steal Theo's. I got – I'll go through as well. I got uh, Grant Sloan coming in off the bench. <laughs> and then I'll do one more just to hopefully get other uh, – and I got Sapanis from Long Beach um, coming up, having a huge performance uh, in the first match. Look at look at Theo mad scrambling <laughs> on the screen right now, <laughs> trying to find someone. <laughs> All right, Theo, you're the man. All right, I got two. I got I got Capono Brown uh, from BYU and their win over Long Island. Um, he hit 14 kills, hit 480, uh, three aces, four digs, and a block assist. Um, and then I, I've got Ethan Smith, 10 kills, zero errors against LMU, the same LMU team that beat Princeton the night before or two couple nights before that. Um, he hit 667, had a pretty nice night. Good picks for the week. As always, we jump into what you're watching in week seven. Um, let's go Brad first on this one. I mean, conference play for the EIVA, the MIVA, and the MPSF starting up. Um, we talked about it already, Grand Canyon, BYU. That's going to be very, very interesting. Theo, do you do you play someone? No, 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 no. Oh, no. <laughs> but there is one match that is the match. And uh -oh. it faces on this screen, and it is the match. Well, go, go. You're hot. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Lewis versus Loyola. The crosstown rivalry is here. It is here, <laughs> fellas. I can't <laughs> wait. Here we go. Cool pilot guy against Hoxie. <laughs> Hopefully, Dan doesn't have to drive up to 405 in order to get there. No. <laughs> uh, it is. Uh, I'm going to plug. It's premium night, too. So it's, uh, you'll see us in our premium uniforms and for the Ray Strong Foundation. So we're going to plug that a little bit. Uh, so. Wear my scarf next week on the show. I would have worn it this weekend. I know. And I was going to ask you, by the way. When you the can race wear it was gonna Monday, be. either way, just so you know, you can wear it. You know I mean? Okay, sounds good. <laughs> so, um, is that your pick then, Theo? Just the one? Uh, that's one. I got one more, but I'll, I'll let I get I'll pop back in. So, I got uh, BYU. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. You no, can't no, 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 back okay. in. And then my other one is George. No, 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 no. You've the set your piece. <laughs> You're not co pilot <laughs> guy. It's co pilot guy time. <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> I guess we'll go over to Jay. So uh, it is the IBA start time. So I'm really excited to see Princeton versus Penn State. Uh, Penn State has been experimenting with their setters in recent weeks. I'm curious to see if they continue to go with Luke or if they go back to Schwab. Uh, and let's see what Princeton can do with a full healthy roster. That will be if they have a whole roster. Uh, obviously, Grand Canyon, BYU. But here is my super pick of the week. Sponsored by the Pothole Filling Association of America, and that is PFW versus Ball State. If you have ever driven on the streets and highways of Indiana, you will know firsthand what it means to have to go to your shock and absorber people on a weekly basis and, and get your tires changed because it is an absolute nightmare. Worse than any 405 drive with naked tent people on the side. I'm telling you right now. Naked 10 people. That's all I remembered from what you've said, Jay. <laughs> well, I think I to add one to that, I'll go quickly because I only have one more. Um, a very similar matchup to the PFW Ball State is Concordia and USC because Concordia comes off of two really nice wins this week. Um, it'll be interesting to see can they sustain that now that USC knows this is the real deal team and we got to come ready. Um, that'll be a fun one. Yep. Dan. Um, well, certainly, uh, you got, uh, Irvine and Stanford, 
So that'll be uh, uh, they played twice, I believe. So that'll be a pretty, pretty great series, I think, in terms of that. And I, I want to make sure I, I give some love to Mason and NJIT. So, you know, Jay's team hasn't played volleyball in a month. I don't know what that's like. And the guys <laughs> golf 15 times. You know what I mean? So maybe he can remember how to coach at the same time. And then NJIT <laughs> will be ready. So uh, but that should be a good one for sure. Uh, and then how does Sam's guys respond uh, to uh, to Penn State, you know that's a, that another key match that we were talking about some Eva stuff. And then one last plug, baby, the Chiefs won. Just so you guys know, thanks. Oh, Mr. Stuff. KC guy in the house, <laughs> Kansas uh, City Swifties, nice. Uh, no. <laughs> well, just great. Uh, a great game. It was a very good game. <laughs> well, I thought it was a Taylor Swift concert. That's why I was watching. <laughs> at the end it was like, they couldn't get off uh kelsey and swift for like 20 minutes at the end i'm like do we really need to watch them make out the whole time right now like what's going on yeah i did feel a little creepy watching them kiss on screen that was not exactly uh, uh, well i'll try and bring us back in just remind everyone that the prince and penn state is the eiva preseason one two so uh you know keep an eye on that one not that jay's not of any value in the eiva we love jay yeah, but it's just gonna be a fun one to watch so uh, for the gentleman on the screen, Theo Edwards of CSUN, Jay Hossick of George Mason, Brad Ross Strider, UC San Diego, and cool pilot guy, also known as Dan Friend of Lewis. Uh, wish you the best this week. Looking forward to chatting next week. Thanks for listening to College Volleyball Weekly. Be sure to follow Rob Espero at the Rob on the Mic on Instagram and at Rob on the Mic on Twitter.